warm welcome to the second Hydrogen Hour at the Transport and Climate Change Week 2021. Yesterday, my dear colleague Charlotte Hussey chaired the first Hydrogen Hour and uh, asking why do we need power to X, PTX for transport? And the discussants already addressed the issue that if we go for PTX in transport, it must be sustainable. Because PTX should not just help us to reach the Paris climate goals, but we should also use it to contribute to a sustainable development on all fronts. It should promote economic prosperity and also create jobs for local communities. It should respect social and societal concerns, such as access to water and resources. And it should ensure a just transition from a fossil to a renewables-based economy and society. So today we will dive deeper into the matter and uh, we will discuss the topic of sustainable PTX production for transport. And we have three eminent experts to help us in making a clearer picture of what is needed. And we have Anna Angel from Inicio in Bogota. We have Nino Berta from Climeworks in Switzerland. And we have Dietrich Brockhagen from Atmosphere here in Berlin. I will introduce them one by one, and I will start with Dietrich Brockhagen. Dietrich is the founder and CEO of Atmosphere, a nonprofit NGO for carbon offsetting. Atmosphere operates in 14 different countries in the global south, and it's engaged in specializing uh, in rural electrification and in green energy transition. It provides access to clean energy, in particular also for um, low-income populations. Atmosphere's gold standard CDM projects save about 1.5 million tons of CO2 annually. And since 2019, Atmosphere is also engaged in designing and uh, developing standards and criteria for power to liquid fuels, in particular in aviation. Dietrich has a PhD and diploma in physics and economics, and he worked in many different uh, settings such as the German Aerospace Center, the European Commission, DG Transport, and the German Federal Ministry for the Environment. Not knowing if we could meet here in person, we have pre-recorded a short interview last week. And before starting that video, I would like to ask you that you already start putting questions and comments into the chat, which should be on the right hand of your screen. And with that, uh, I hope the video will start. You are the founder and uh, CEO of Atmosphere. Atmosphere is a climate protection initiative engaging in projects in the Global South. And you are offering companies and consumers opportunities for compensating their uh, climate footprint if they take uh, an airplane. So 
for atmosphere, you have developed and you're applying strict sustainability standards for projects and measures which qualify for compensation. Um, but is compensation really enough? No, by no means. We always say it's the second best instrument and it does not the job. I mean, for the Paris Agreement to be achieved, we need the decarbonization of the full industry, including the airline industry. So we need to target the aviation industry itself, uh, cutting emissions at source. And that means you also have to deal with the fuels. So replacing fossil fuels with what's now called sustainable aviation fuels. Um, but often this is biofuel. Uh, isn't that a problem? And how do you see the next steps? Yeah, biofuel is a problem. And this whole term of sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, is misleading. Uh, because mostly you encounter problems like um, uh, the area conflict uh, with regards to biofuel. So um, you run into, into, uh, into a conflict of objectives, food production on the one hand versus um, uh, fuel production on the other side. Uh, so um, yeah, the, uh, biofuels are prone to conflict, potential is limited, so synthetic fuels is the answer. So synthetic fuels means uh fuels based on power to liquid technology, but um, aren't there also sustainability concerns that need to be addressed? Yes, there are. They are uh, smaller than with biofuels, but there are there. So uh, obviously, uh, first thing, first, we, we need to uh, make sure that the power supply, which is crucial and which uh, needs huge amount of, of, of power, is truly additional. So to make sure that it, uh, uh, power to liquid does not go on, on the expense of the overall energy transition, but uh, fuels it, so to say. So additionality of, of, uh, of power. And then, of course, the, CO the carbon sources. They, you may run into the same type of problem as with biofuels. So we have to make sure uh, that it's no um, um, fossil fuels. Um, so no carbon um, uh, extracted from, from any coal, oil, or whatever, uh, nor the processing like in refineries, but also this uh, no, no point industri industrial sources like cement uh, or um, steel, because um, these, uh, these sources, you, you may end up in a, in a locked-in effect, because if you, if you hand over a life straw to these, those industries or carbon emissions from those industries, uh, just to, to produce uh, uh, power to liquid fuels, then you, you also miss the, 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 the goal of full industry. Okay, but uh, where would you get the CO2 which you need in the process? Where would you get it from to be carbon neutral? Uh, to my mind, there's two clean sources. One is direct air capture, which is expensive, but uh, prices will come down. So this is definitely sustainable. And the other is uh, like um, biogenic sources so from agricultural residues. So not uh, growing crops in order to, to get the carbon, but from agricultural uh, residues, from manure, and so on. So uh, this is a safe source. OK. In the word hydrogen, because hydrogen is uh, a step in the value chain, uh, there is hydro, there is water, and many people are concerned that uh, water stress and might become uh, a limiting factor. Do you see this? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think um, in, in most uh, countries of the solar belt where, where um, solar energy might be uh, really economic, uh, water stress is an issue, and uh, all these areas are marked by there's, there's a water uh, UN water organization, and they mark different stress levels. So this has to be taken into account absolutely. Taken into account, but you would also agree that uh, probably countries like Germany and Europe will need to import uh, hydrogen or derived products such as PTX, PTL. Yeah. I mean, for, for obvious reasons, um, uh, all those countries, in, from, from Europe, Northern Europe, they are, I mean, maybe with the exception of Norway, energy prices are high and um, sun is not there. And uh, in those other countries in the global south, uh, sun is abundant and areas is, is mostly not a problem. So the, the, the preferable, uh, suitable uh, places for power to, gen uh, power to, to liquid generation or um, 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 H2 is, is in the global south. 
So once we go to the Global South, um, is it enough to assess only the environmental sustainability criteria or do we have to have a broader concept, including also other dimensions? Yeah, I, I think the, 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 the potential issues attached to those um, industrial plants are the same as, as uh, uh, attached to all other big industrial plants. So uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, it's a standard issue. So you should apply a standard ESG rules, so environmental, social, and uh, government uh, governance criteria, like um, um, European investment is applying, or the equator, equator pr principles. So if you apply those, I think you are uh, in, a, in a safe realm. So you have to address like uh, issues like cultural heritage. Uh, involuntary resettlement, labor standards, uh, stakeholder engagement, and so on. Yeah. But this, this is pretty standard as for all big uh, industry uh, plans to be set up uh, in the Global South. Yes. And uh, maybe a final word, uh, do we need internationally agreed certification schemes? And what is your experience with such certification schemes? Yeah, I, I think um, we need those schemes and um, th there should be standards. And the problem is, of course, to, to who is going to, to develop them and to apply them. I mean, the, the knowledge is there. I mean, we have, we have learned from, uh, let, let's take the CDN, for example. We have, we have uh, created a, a huge body of experience for, for 20 years in all of the world, in, in, in most developing countries. And um, we have made so many bad experiences with uh, CDM projects and uh, how to tackle them, how to assess them. So the, the, this, this body and, and, and the, the, uh, the, the, the auditors are also there. It's, it's like 20 DOEs accredited to the United Nations who possess uh, this, this knowledge and it, it's documented in, in, in um, uh, countless manuals, methodologies and so on. So this is there and it can be transferred to power to liquid as well or it can be uh, maybe partly even applied. So, so this is there and uh, the experience shows that um, of course, um, uh, you, you have to, 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 to get it right from the start with the right bodies uh, taking care of it. So my, um, uh, my recommendation would be that governments should, should play the leading roles. Otherwise, we end up like in, in ICAO with, with the Corsier standards. This is, this is a mess. <laughs> okay. Dietrich, I'm afraid uh, it would have been exciting to continue our discussion. We had eight minutes. I guess we've done ten. Uh, thank you very much. All the best for your endeavors. And uh, we at the PTX Hub, we will try to advance those agendas which you raised. Thank you very much. I thank you. I know. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, as we've just heard from Dietrich, we will need to make sure that the entire value chain for producing power to X or power to liquid products which finally end up in transportation are sustainable. It starts with the energy, which of course should come from renewable sources, but it should also be additional in order not to undermine the already ongoing transition towards a renewable energy system. Once we process the hydrogen in the um, value chain, we also need carbon. And Dietrich has mentioned that. And there, he suggested that direct air capture would be the perfect solution. Climeworks is a pioneering company on a global scale that is a leader in DAC, direct air capture technology. And our next speaker, Nino Berta, he is the project developer and sales manager at uh, Climeworks. Nino holds a master's degree in energy and resource management here from the Technical University in Berlin. And now he works on PTX products and projects that integrate DAC into the production of 
uh, fuels and other feedstocks. So as a trained industrial designer and engineer, he benefits from the knowledge of the technical details, but meanwhile, in cooperating with big firms, with governments, with NGOs and others, uh, he has also been, become a very experienced uh, person in the market. So we will hear from him what the perspective of Climeworks is with regard to direct air capture. Over uh, to thanks you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about Climeworks and our direct air capture technology. Uh, my name is Nino Berta. I'm a sales manager for our carbon removal certificates, and but also a project developer for our current e-fuels projects. I'm trying to share my screen now. So I want to show you today how direct air capture can contribute um, that we will reach our net zero emission targets in the future. So um, the science is clear to limit global warming to below 1.5 degrees. We need to reduce emissions, but also remove emissions from the atmosphere again. And Climeworks or direct air capture can contribute to both of these goals. And um, so we can, with air captured CO2, we can replace fossil carbon and we can produce fuels or any carbon-based materials. But we can also, by capturing CO2 and storing it permanently on the ground, we can neutralize unavoidable emissions, but we can also realize negative emissions. How does it actually work? So this is um, the core uh, of our technology, so-called Climeworks collector, CO2 collector. It's actually a big vacuum cleaner, so it sucks in air. Uh, the CO2 molecules within the air stuck to a specific filter material. Uh, once, it is, once it is saturated, we, we close down uh, the collector box, we heat it up, and then the pure CO2 is released again from the filter material, and then which we can collect then. And this pure CO2 you can either utilize further for production of fuels, for example, but of course, as I said, store it permanently. And storing it permanently, how does it actually work? Um, this is a picture of a geothermal power plant we're working together with in, uh, in Iceland. Um, so we have renewable energy powering our direct air capture facility, which you can see here on the right hand side. This facility then is capturing CO2. As explained before, we mix it with water. We inject it into the water cycle of the geothermal power plant and inject it approximately 1000 meters underground. And there it is within only two years mineralized into carbonate minerals. So it's really it's really um, a very permanent solution to remove carbon from the air. So carbon uh, at the gaseous stage in the air turned into rock underground. And as you can imagine, as it is turned into rock, this is really hard to be released again, and it's uh, stored away for, for millennia to come. This is one thing we're doing with direct air capture. The other thing is um, we're, we're closing the carbon circle. And this is really when uh, Climeworks was founded 11 years ago, it was it actually founded with this idea in mind to create a, a truly carbon neutral fuel. And the basic principle here is simple. Um, you capture CO2 from the air, you put it together with green hydrogen to form syngas, you liquefy that syngas to uh, refine it then into applicable fuels in the end and being it jet fuel, gasoline, or diesel, uh, shipping fuel, whatever, or any carbon-based material in general, whatever you want. And then through the combustion of this, these fuels or the usage of these materials, CO2 is released again, but the same amount that has been captured before is released into the atmosphere. So you really have a truly carbon neutral fuel or product created. This is really the, the main advantage of using air captured CO2 to produce fuels or materials. So the emission reduction potential, because you close the cycle, is theoretically around 100%. Imagine you take that CO2 from a smokestack or from an, uh, from an emission source, from a fossil emission source, you actually just recycle that CO2 once, you let it out into the air again, and um, it still accumulates 
the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So there you have, from point sources, you have an emission reduction potential only from 50%. Another advantage is the, the scalability. So CO2 from the air is really an unlimited CO2 source, and it's not bound as with um, to any to any feedstock feedstock problem. Supply, supply problem, sorry, um, that we have, for example, with biofuels. So if we look at the demand of e-fuels in the future or renewable fuels in general, biofuels are really limited by their, by their land, by their water usage. And uh, you don't have that with, um, with CO2 from the air. Since you, you can use the same amount of CO2 all over again in a, in a cycle, it's only restricted by the availability of renewable energy. And the third advantage, um, as you might know, the main cost driver uh, of producing e-fuels is the electricity cost. So you want to produce your e-fuels where electricity is cheap, and this is mainly in remote areas. But in remote areas, most likely there will be no CO2. So if you really want to produce low-cost e-fuels with direct air capture, you can tap in where electricity is cheap and make the cheapest e-fuel you can get. Um, Climeworks was really at the forefront of um, of the integration of direct air capture in the, into to the technology chain of uh, of e-fuels. So we we've been um, the world's first, or we've been part of the world's first project to to actually demonstrate that you can produce fuels from air. Uh, it was only a few liters a day, but we we showed that it's possible. And now the next steps that we're taking, uh, we're part of two consortia, the Norsk E-Fuel Consortium in, in Norway and the Zenit Consortium in, in Rotterdam to build one of the, the, the first um, larger scale or industrial scale plants that produce several thousand liters um, a day. And this is really important because um, if you're looking uh, into the future where we really need to produce a lot of renewable fuels, uh, no financial institution will, will give you a grant or money um, in, in, in that range if, if this has never been proven uh, at an industrial stage. So this is really important to, to take that next step to demonstrate that it's working and not only a few days, but a full year and that you can handle uh, um, fluctuant renewable energy, for example, all that needs to be proven. Uh, at that stage, and this is why we're we're working uh, on these two projects. So, as a last slide, just as a main uh, key takeaway, um, why we think direct air capture will be the main CO2 source, CO2 source for e-fuel in the future. As I said, uh, the availability of point sources of unavoidable point sources is is limited in the future, and as this study by the German um, Energy Agency. Um, very uh, much uh, points out that um, the most part, over 80% in 2050, has to come from direct air capture, just because of the fact there is no, um, not enough uh, unavoidable CO2 point sources around anymore at that stage in time. Thank you very much. Um, this was it. Happy, uh, yeah, to answer any questions after after the whole event. Um, please get in touch with me if you have um, further questions. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Well, thank you, Nino. This has been an exciting insight into how to close the carbon cycle. And we will now close our cycle of presentations with a third input from Colombia, from Ana Angel. She is with Inicio. Inicio is a global consulting firm specialized in particular on uh, energy and transport issues with a focus on hydrogen. Anna has 10 years of experience working uh, on markets, technologies, and also policies for sustainable energy and transport. Uh, and she has come around quite a bit. She studied um, and has a bachelor in mechanical engineering and a master's in environment and uh, energy. 
and a strong focus on hydrogen. And uh, she has the masters from distinguished universities in France, in Spain, in Sweden, and also in her professional life. She's been stationed uh, in Belgium, in Colombia, but also in Mexico, in Venezuela, and in the US. So um, she is doing research and consultancy for uh, a lot of companies and countries, a total of uh, more than 15, and she gained comprehensive experience in renewable energy and sustainable uh, mobility matters. And uh, I therefore look forward to her presentation over to Colombia. Again, we have to cross the ocean. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here with you today. I will be speaking today about sustainability best practices around uh, Power to X projects in Latin America. So, uh, hopefully, you're seeing my screen right now. Before we start, I would just like to briefly introduce Inicio. We're a strategy consulting uh, firm very, very much specialized in hydrogen, which we've been working uh, for the past 15 years. Uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot of where we have offices and where we work. Okay, so to jump right into it, uh, this is a study we have recently conducted for the GIZ in Costa Rica. And one of the first questions uh, we've been asking ourselves is, uh, does Costa Rica have enough uh, renewable potential uh, to produce uh, green hydrogen or will it compromise its own electricity uh, demand? And what we have found is that uh, Costa Rica can uh, produce 10 times more uh, renewable electricity than it will uh, consume. Uh, according to the demand scenario, the official demand scenario the country has all the way to 2040. Uh, so that leaves a uh, huge room uh, to produce uh, green hydrogen. And this is also the case in other countries in the region we've looked at. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't worry about uh, that. Hmm? Uh, another slide also from the same uh, study in Costa Rica, where we have analyzed the potential for the replacement of fossil fuels in the industry and in the transportation sector in Costa Rica. And as you can see, uh, the, uh, the energy matrix of Costa Rica is already uh, quite uh, clean because it is already 70% carbon neutral, mostly based on biomass, and that remaining 30% can easily uh, be uh, converted to green hydrogen to replace that diesel, fuel oil, LPG. And same for the transportation sector, uh, so that, for example, that 42% of the consumption, uh, which is diesel, can easily be um, uh, converted uh, into green hydrogen used on uh, fuel cell electric vehicles that are very well suited for heavy duty segments that are those that uh, generally consume uh, diesel. Here you can see the, the potential for emissions reduction uh, in Costa Rica. So Costa Rica could save uh, 2.68 million tons of CO2 in the year uh, 2050, mostly in the transportation sector. Costa Rica is not a very industrialized country. So here we have the case um, where uh, the potential is mostly on the transport sector. But we're going to look now at another case. This is another study for the GIZ uh, in Mexico that we have uh, recently uh, conducted. And we can see here how uh, also the transport sector is the one with the largest potential for buses and heavy duty uh, vehicles. But also you can see some very good potentials uh, around uh, uh, some industries like 
like cement, uh, like um, steel, and uh, the the potential that to replace mining trucks to produce uh, synthetic fuels via hydrogen. So really, a, a lot of potential also in the industry because uh, in, in Mexico is, is is more industrialized. So Mexico could avoid almost four million tons of CO2 in the year 2050, which is is huge according to the scenarios we have developed. There are realistic scenarios, and that will allow Mexico and Costa Rica, in the case I showed before, to comply with the um, uh, carbon mitigation uh, targets uh, these countries have. Uh, here uh, you can see uh, the CO2 emissions avoided per kilogram of hydrogen. You can see how they are different uh, from sector to sector, so a little bit uh, more potential uh, in the transport sector as you can reduce uh, more kilograms of, uh, of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. Um, this is an analysis we did for Costa Rica, so the last part, which is a fossil fuel replacement in the industry, largely depends on the composition of that energy consumption in that industry. As we've seen before, the Costa Rica one is mostly based on diesel, LPG, fuel oil, uh, but you also, of course, have some other countries where the industrial energy consumption uh, gears more towards uh, natural gas, and that will give us a different emissions factor. But you can see the order of magnitude is, is quite uh, similar, you know, the values uh, in the different sectors. Uh, so that is something to bear in mind when we are analyzing projects. Uh, so not only uh, what type of application can reduce the most carbon per kilogram of hydrogen, but we also should take a look at the uh, abatement costs. Because here, for example, you can see on the graph on the right, this is also for Costa Rica, how for certain uh, segments of the mobility, reducing emissions is quite costly. That is the case for passenger cars. Whereas, for example, for heavy duty trucks, you can see that already in 2030, it will be cheaper to own a, a fuel cell electric trucks than to own a diesel trucks in Costa Rica. Therefore, you have a negative abatement cost, which makes this really uh, interesting. So when we are looking at uh, selecting uh, different uh, projects, um, we should also look at the abatement costs in order to take into consideration the most uh, competitive uh, segments. Um, Another question we are asked a lot is water consumption. So how much water does electrolysis consume? Is it really a lot? Are we creating a problem uh, when we are trying to solve the climate change problem? Are we creating a water scarcity problem? And uh, let us show you the the um, the answer. Uh, so we, here we have analyzed uh, the consumption of uh, energy in, in Chile, which is what you can see on the left. So out of that total energy consumption, we have selected um, the consumption of uh, diesel, natural gas, um, uh, LPG and gasoline. And uh, those four um, fossil fuels account for 162 uh, terakalories per year. And we have uh, analyzed how much water will we need to replace all of that energy consumption uh, via green hydrogen produced with electrolysis. And the answer is uh, 2.15 uh, cubic meters of water per second, which may sound like a lot, but let's put this into perspective. So what is the water consumption in Chile? Uh, as you can see there, the water consumption uh, in, in Chile is in the order of almost uh, 5,000 uh, cubic meters per second. And out of that, 7% is consumptive use of water. Consumptive use of water is the water that is removed from supplies that cannot return to uh, the water resources. So basically it is wasted. It, it is not renewable water if you want. Uh, and um, those 2.15 cubic meters of water per second are less than 1% of that consumptive use of water in Chile. So 0.6%. So really replacing all that energy, like the whole national consumption of diesel, natural gas, LPG, and gasoline, wouldn't consume 
even 1% of the water uh, in Chile. So, so you can see this is not really a problem. Mm -hmm. And here also we are showing an analysis we did uh, a year and a half ago uh, together with LBST, a German company. We did this for a Costa Rican client and we analyzed the water consumption across the whole life cycle, meaning from the extraction of the materials all the way to production, usage and final disposition of um, different vehicles. We were analyzing here fuel cell electric vehicles against battery electric vehicles. And you can see there how in all the five segments we analyzed, the water consumption uh, during the whole life cycle is higher for battery electric vehicles. And this is simply because the uh, extraction of the lithium used for the batteries is very, very water intensive. So uh, in those mines in Chile where this lithium is extracted, uh, you have a lot, a lot of uh, water uh, wasted. So we should also take that into account is not only the electrolysis, but the whole life cycle of the projects. And with this, I would just want to uh, finish. Uh, here are my contact details in case anyone wants to ask any uh, follow-up question. And uh, I would like to thank you very much. I hope you have found uh, this presentation informative. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. Thanks to Colombia for this uh, very detailed and substantive uh, input. And you covered not just uh, Colombia, you covered Costa Rica, Chile, and uh, other Latin American uh, countries. Now we move on to the question and answer session. And unfortunately, Anna is missing. Um, Charlotte Hussey, my colleague who is the co-founder of Women in Green Hydrogen, will be very angry with us uh, that we have, again, a male-only panel. But uh, nonetheless, very warm welcome. Uh, to you, Dietrich Brockhagen and uh, Nino Berta. You made it into our um, chat here. Um, chat, please, those who have listened to us, please use the chat function to put questions to us. And I have, in fact, already received a few uh, questions. So I would um, maybe like to start with you, Dietrich. We've heard about all the sustainability needs along the supply chain. Uh, don't we risk to build up too high barriers um, that we don't manage to organize the trade-off because we are too ambitious? Yeah, certainly there's a, a risk connected to this. Uh, obviously, um, you shouldn't throw out the, 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 the baby with the bath tube uh, by changing the water. But uh, so, so we have uh, to take into account those criteria, but not forget that we have to build up an industry. So uh, it's a question of timing and of, of, of quotas. But um, let's not forget, I, um, uh, if we think from the end, in the year 2050, when, when the whole world and the industry needs to be decommunized, uh, many of those CO2 sources, for example, won't be uh, existing anymore. They, they have to decline in, in the next decades to come. So um, what I'm saying is um, there's also a risk uh, connected to it in the other way. If you rely today on, on, uh, on carbon sources uh, for a PTX production, which um, are bound to, to go extinct within the next um, decades, then you might also run into an economic, economic problem. So I, I think compromises need to be done. And uh, within our thinking, of course, um, you can have um, phase in um, uh, um, areas where, where you, uh, or periods where you could allow for, for less sustainable uh, sources of CO2, for example. But in the long run, it has to be um, along the lines with which I uh, tried to line up before. Well, thank you, Dietrich. Uh, and I have a follow-up question to, to Nino uh, from, I guess it's India, from uh, Prashant Kumar, who says, well, your installation, which we see in the back, 
um, it needs energy. And uh, if that comes from fossil sources, then we may not, not have won uh, a lot. And maybe I can add an additional question. Uh, why making things so complicated? There are point sources from industry where we have plenty of CO2 and where the CO2 is almost uh, for free. So wouldn't that at least in the beginning be the more economic solution? Yeah, I would say so, yes. Uh, I think, or also we at Climber think that we, we need to use these sources uh, now but somehow we also, we also already know that we need to phase them out at some point. And that, as Dietrich says, we need to decarbonize the whole economy until 2050. And uh, we can use them now and it's, it's wise to use them now, um, but we still need to think about the future and that we need to decarbonize. And we need, also need to start scaling up direct air capture, scaling up the capacity and also uh, and by scaling up, lowering the cost of direct air capture that we are ready in 2050 to supply uh, the, the huge amounts of carbon we, we need. And regarding the first uh, part of your question, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it does, definitely doesn't make sense to, to use fossil-based uh, energy sources to, to power direct air capture. And this is also not what we, what we do. Uh, I talked about the plant in, in Iceland. There we use geothermal um, energy, uh, this plant here. Uh, in Zurich uses uh, the waste heat of a uh, waste incineration plant uh, next to it. So, uh, and, and by using renewable energy, we uh, direct air capture from Climax has a, has a carbon footprint of around 10%. So with each ton of CO2 that we capture, we, our process it itself emits another uh, 100 kilograms. So in terms of CO2 efficiency, it's already quite efficient and it, it makes sense, yeah, if you use renewable energy. Well, there is an additional question from Lena Hermann, and she asks, isn't it dangerous to store the CO2 underground? Are you actually doing this, or is it directly used in processes? Uh, we do both. So we, we uh, produce fuels with the CO2, uh, but we also sequester CO2 and uh, yeah, I, I would say it's um, it's totally safe, <laughs> and uh, of course I have to say it uh, since I'm working for Climax and uh, we sequester that. But there are at the site where we sequester the, the CO2, there uh, there are uh, ongoing scientific studies for for over 10 years now that that monitor how the the CO2 how it reacts on the ground and. Um, and it's actually it's actually a, a natural process. So the mineralization of the, the the gaseous CO2 into carbonate minerals occurs anyway uh, in in nature. Normally, it takes several thousand years to do that. But uh, because of the volcanic activity in Iceland, the, the high temperatures, the high pressure we have there on the ground, it only takes takes two years. And in the end, it's just it's just stone. It's rock. It's carbonate minerals, and you can find that uh, everywhere in, in in the Earth's crusts. Okay, so that's the setting in Iceland, um, but I guess uh, we will still have uh, big debates about carbon storage in uh, Germany. And uh, I wonder what uh, Dietrich is thinking about, A, the issue of um, shall we in the beginning be more flexible? How are we phasing in the higher standards? And I think the question addressed the bigger issue. How do we interact with the public? How do we engage uh, populations both in Europe but also in our partner countries to trust and to see the benefit that these technologies also bring for them? Dietrich. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, um, we have seen in the past um, projects which somehow looked a bit like energy neocolonialism, uh, to, to say it in brief. So, um, and of course, uh, the suspicion uh, could be here that uh, somehow uh, countries from the north come to the south in order to exploit uh, cheap solar energy and uh, other resources beat um, just vast areas available for, for uh, DLC. 
uh, plants to be set up. So and and then just to to export all the benefits in uh, in, in terms of H2 or um, hydrogen or, uh, or or PTX fuels and to export it um, um, back to Europe or wherever in the north and uh, to just uh, 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 yeah. Deprive them of, of all the benefits from the from the value chain. So this is uh, this is definitely um, a challenge, and I think um, it it should be communicated from from the onset, uh, like uh, an energy partnership with with developing countries or uh, countries in the global south. So um, making sure that um, those those projects and plants are planned. Um, in a comprehensive way. So um, let's say if, if you go to a country like Morocco or uh, wherever, where um, uh, rural electrification is, 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 is not yet done. So where, uh, where there are vast areas in a country where, where, where there's not yet uh, any access to electricity. So then you could combine um, uh, uh, DSC or a um, um, power to liquid plant um, uh, not only with the solar park uh, providing energy for, for, for those plants, but also a solar plant for the entire region. And uh, so this would be more costly, of course, for the investor, and they, they might shy away from it. But this would send a clear signal, if this could be established in, in the standard, that this is uh, 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 okay. sought to be a partnership rather than an exploitation of, of, of the global south. Thank you, Dietrich. We have to look at the clock also. Uh, and uh, I still have quite a few questions. Um, one I might even answer myself uh, by Francis Mwangi, and I think it fits nicely. Is there any uh, support for developing countries in terms of uh, finance, but also knowledge transfer, etc. So if you allow me, I would like to make some advertisement for the International PTX Hub. That is precisely what the PTX Hub is for. So please go to our website, get in touch, and we are currently also organizing training courses. Uh, with that intermezzo, moving from carbon to the issue of water. Dietrich, I think you addressed uh, the issue. And when you said that also access to electricity could be provided for local populations, you need water. And where there is sun and wind, there isn't necessarily water. There might be regions with huge water stress. And if we go for desalinization, um, are there ways to combine the energy part with provision of water to local populations and farming? Yeah, I, I think technologically there, there are uh, solutions there. Um, as you said, desalinization, uh, it works as a proven concept. It needs a lot of energy, but uh, far less energy than uh, needed for uh, power to x production anyway. so. Uh, the technology is there, and uh, especially for for landlocked countries, uh, it might be needed because um, yeah, you, you have some somehow to, to, to work with water scarcity. I, I, I Anna made her point that there's not so much water needed. That's uh, that may be correct if if you bring it to a big country like uh, like Chile. But if you go uh, to a country where where there's uh, as a scarcity with regard to water anyway, uh, you're going to aggravating the problem. So um, you 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 you, you should should steer away from this, and um, so the desalination um, uh, will be um, a technical solution here. Whether it's applied, this is again a question of the goodwill of the investors. So that's uh, that's my agenda to make sure that if um, we produce PTX in the solar belt or the global south of the world, then make, let's make sure that it's uh, not neocolonialism, but it's um, it's a partnership, and then um, investors would also provide the means in order to uh, to address water scarcity and um, um, invest also in, in water desalination. Well, I'm afraid uh, we uh, need to come to the crucial question, and maybe Nino can answer that. Uh, economically, uh, where are we with regard to cost competitiveness? How do you see the transition? Do you see uh, a cost degression 
like we have seen it in PV technology. And uh, maybe you could elaborate a bit on your modular approach. Uh, do you see upscaling by size, creating bigger units, or do you see upscaling by number, uh, producing series of uh, installations? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. And, and of course, there will be um, cost regression over time. I mean, you 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 have to see that uh, this plant uh, here at the back is uh, was commissioned in 2017, and uh, this is not uh, far away. And this was somehow the, the first generation of Climax plant uh, at an industrial level. Now we're talking about the second generation in Iceland. And there are only still three companies in the world that have commercially available direct air capture technologies. And, uh, and of course, more and more companies will come. We will evolve as well. We will develop the technology further and uh, the cost will go down. I think there's no doubt about that, like in, in PV and, and wind. And our approach indeed is a, is a model approach. So you see we have, uh, yeah, and as I explained, we have one uh, specific CO2 collector and we want to lower our cost by um, mass manufacture these uh, CO2 collectors. And you, you, you can see it behind me, it's, it's about the size of a car. And we know the automobile, automotive industry is, um, is very suitable and very well known to, to uh, mass manufacture these kind of uh, things or the, these kind of sizes of uh, uh, equipment and materials. And we had that in mind when we de developed these collectors. And um, we foresee that, yeah, by, by numbering up uh, and, and mass produce these CO2 collectors, we can uh, very much uh, decrease the cost of, of direct air capture in the future. But it's not about, it's not about only about the manufacturing costs, also, also about the operational costs with the, the filter material that we, that we use that will evolve, um, stuff like that. The process that will get, will get better uh, over time. So there is a lot of potential still to come. Well, thank you very much. Time is running and I'm seeing it in big letters here on the monitor. We've already exceeded by one minute and I even got uh, a call in my ear. We need to stop. Uh, we received really very interesting inputs from you, not forget uh, Anna. And uh, therefore, it's now my turn to thank you all. Uh, you, the participants who have uh, stayed with us and listened and put in comments and questions, and I apologize for those uh, which we have perhaps not answered. Uh, thanks to you, the presenters and discussants in our round, and a big thanks also to the people behind me. There are lots of GIZ and PTX hub staff who have not just now technically, but already over several weeks been busy in preparing this. Uh, this is not the end. The hydrogen hour show goes on. Tomorrow we will have the third hydrogen hour, which will dive more specifically and deeper into the application of PTX and PTL in aviation and in shipping with my colleague Alexander Mahler. And therefore, stay in touch with the PTX hub, go to our website, and a last request, we are competing during Hydrogen Week, and you have the chance to put five stars on those events which you liked most. So check on the agenda or wherever it is and uh, give us a good rating. It's been a pleasure to moderate this session. Thank you. In Berlin, now it's lunchtime. In Asia, it will be a very late dinner. And in Latin America and North America, it will probably be a very early breakfast. Thank you and take care.